Hey everybody, this is Eli from Elf Bait. Uh, taking a break from the Dungeons & Dragons 30-day challenge, which if you've been watching, great. If not, <clears throat> you know, thanks for tuning in. Uh, check them out. It's me talking about my life with the game. <clears throat> I think I'm losing my voice. But anyways, I was watching... When I was watching um, another YouTuber's um, coverage of um, the, you know, the 30 day challenge, there was a comment that was made, I believe it was over at Taking 20, but there was a comment that was made about kind of the, the lack of use of the Fae in D&D. And I know that this is not the first place I've heard about it. Um, I think uh, Jim Davis over at WebDM had actually commented once about how... Uh, the Fae in 5th edition seem to be kind of marginalized. And if Jim Davis is, ever catches this video and I'm wrong, please set me right. But I, I heard it somewhere, and, and I tend to agree. Uh, in 5th edition, especially after coming off of the previous editions, we'd had a lot of buildup of Fae creatures throughout 3rd edition and even in 2nd edition, uh, I think part of that has to come from Dieter Lisi doing a good chunk of the, the art uh, for the Planescape setting, but Planescape was a great excuse to create fey-type creatures, and even if they weren't fey, they often looked feyish because, well, his style of art. But anyways, <clears throat> the fey seem to be sort of the forgotten... Uh, forgotten uh, outsider type. And I want to—I I will lump them in from with outsiders, but they're different. So demons and genies and devils and archons and solars and ismons and elementals—none of them really live in the real world on a full-time basis, or at least by choice. Now, granted, in fifth edition and in, a, in the previous editions, you know, just leading up to it, the Fey did come from the Fey Wild, and that is their home, but. <clears throat> Many of them choose to reside on the material plane on a regular basis. They're doing so because they either like it there or they got some task or whatever. And <clears throat> this seems to have sort of gone by the wayside. Now, in my games in the past, I love playing up fairies, the fae, in a way that is reminiscent of how they were really thought of in Earth's history, Earth's folklore. Now, uh, you're very, no matter where you go around the world, you have cultures that very much believe that there are fey like creatures, whether that's the trolls in, in, you know, in Scandinavia or the fairies, you know, in, the, you know, the UK, the kami in Japan, all of these things, there's a blurred line between, you know, sort of religious figures and there's this gray area where you have these creatures that are not of this world, but they live on the world. But very much I like that, that European folk style of fairy and that is how I have in the past played <clears throat> my fairies played the fae from my campaign settings and I think that's actually a way to <clears throat> um, kind of address sort of their lack of of positioning in D&D &D. your demons devils solars and all of that stuff those are the things that are sitting out there on the other on the outer planes and they're the ones that are going to get summoned in or they're going to be on, on Earth to do no good. But I think that the Fey are a chance to in, interface with something that is otherworldly, that is not the undead, it's not a ghost, it's not a specter or a wraith. It is something that is physical and exists in an otherworldly kind of nature, but it exists as part of the world. And there are ways you can do this that make it really easy. Now, the 5th edition, I, I want to take a moment and talk about 5th edition's roster for Fae so far. <clears throat> now, the primary two primary resources where you're going to find Fae, and there may have been more that have been released, and I know that like there are a couple more that came out in Tomb of Annihilation, but the Monster Manual has seven. And those are the Blink Dog, Pixie, Sprite, Satyr Dryad, Sea Hag, and Green Hag. <clears throat> Volo's Guide adds another 10, more than doubling the number of Fey in the game. And that's with the Boggle, the Darkling, Quickling, the Darkling Elder, which really isn't adding a new Fey, it's just an advanced version of the Darkling, Meanlock, Redcap, Yeth Hound, Anis Hag, Bower Hag, and Korid. So, 
those are our good starting spot. But you know what's funny is, is looking at this roster, what's missing are some of the most useful fey. We don't have brownies. We don't have leprechauns. We don't have those, those fey that you would expect to really be hanging in and around houses. What we need are things like, you know, domovoys and, 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 you know, and, and other creatures. But you can use these as a start. So how, how do you use the fey in D&D without having them be just rank encounters? Well, part of the way that you use the fey is, is not with the fey themselves. You use it through the NPCs that are in your world and how they react with their belief that the fey are out there and around them and doing, you know, at, and living as part of their world. You know, if you ever watch, remember the movie, um, if you ever, you know, watch the movie uh, Legend, you remember that when the, uh, the, the princess in there is wandering out into the woods, you know, she's warned to avoid toadstools and old oaks and stuff like that. These are the sorts of things that you can put in with your NPCs to build this concept that the fairies are out there, that the fae are out there. So the fae almost become a monster in your game, an encounter in your game, without ever actually even having to encounter them. Uh, in one of the games I ran, uh, the, the players came to an inn, and they stayed up past closing, and they noticed that the, uh, the matron of the inn, she came down and she laid next to the hearth a bowl of milk, uh, and a, uh, a bowl of milk and some honey rolls. And they're like, what are you doing? And she didn't answer them. She just went off on their own. And so when they got up in the morning, came down to do their meal, uh, in the center of the table was the bowl from the, uh, the bowl from, you know, that, that the food had been served in. Uh, and it was full of mice and you know, harmful bugs and basically, you know, and, and the, the players realized then that what she'd been doing is leaving out an offering for the house bay that was there, whatever, you know, house elf or Dobby you want to make it, you know, it doesn't really matter. They never saw it. They just knew that. And it had taken the offering of the milk and the honey rolls and it had responded in kind by cleaning up the inn, ridding it of pests. And so, there, there are subtle things you can do. Uh, another way to do this is, you know, as far as folk belief, whether it's for uh, fae or not, you know, if there are charms uh, scratched into doorways and windows, or maybe mesh nets are left hanging over windows, uh, these could be things that the locals are doing to make sure that their homes aren't invaded by harmful uh, fae, you know, the unseely, if you will. You know, maybe... You know, this is the way that they, they keep them out. Um, superstitions are a good way. Uh, if there are things that your villagers are doing when certain words are said, or if they're avoiding certain places, this is another way for you to use the fey. Uh, and fey can be used as great ways to get your characters on the right path. One of the games I ran a long time ago um, had the party run into an old man who was sitting in a tree fishing in a pond and they asked this old man what he was doing and he was saying he was fishing for this red salmon um don't get me wrong what's a salmon doing in a pond doesn't matter i just you know threw that out there sam you know, i'm from the northwest so salmon are on our brain but um <clears throat> also salmon have a particular connotation for wisdom and, 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 and stuff in Celtic myth. So he's fishing for this red salmon and uh, they ask him, you know, well, you know, why are you doing that? And this, the, the, you know, he says he's hungry, but he asks, he tells the party that if they will help him catch the salmon so he can eat it, they, he, he will grant them a great service. And so party agrees, well, you know, Hey, you know this. This guy's gonna give us a favor. That's cool. We'll help him. You know, they were biting here. I don't think anybody actually bothered to ask what the favor was, or if you know, is it a magical favor? Or are you just gonna you know, sew my socks up? Whatever. 
<clears throat> or is it going to be a favor I can call in a later date? Are you the... Of course, in D&D, &D, you're always wondering, is the guy, the innocent guy you're meeting, like, the master of the Order of Assassins or whatever? So they bit. So they help him fish for the, for the salmon. They catch the salmon. And they're about to hand the salmon over. And the salmon tells, asks them kindly not to. So first of all, the party is dealing with a talking fish. And then, of course, the old man is like, give me the fish. We had a deal. And the salmon's like, no, you know, he, the old man's not what he seems. Please, you know, do not give me to, 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 to the old man. You know, if you do, if you do so, that will be the end of me. You know, and, and certainly I can help you, uh, far more than he could. Something to those long lines, you know, whatever. It's been 20 years since I ran that game, 15, whatever. But, um, you know, so the party has to deliberate. Do they believe the fish or do they believe the old man? The old man is kind of disheveled. He looks like he could use a meal. So they're depriving the old man of food if they don't give him the fish. But the fish is talking. Old man really, really wanting to eat the fish. Talking fish. So the party makes the right decision. They side with the fish. As you do. Because talking fish. Anyways, they, they side with the talking fish. The old man goes into a rage. And he transforms to his true self. Which... I believe at the time I used the stats for Korid. This is, I think, 2nd edition D&D. &D. Um, Monster Manual 2 uh, had had the Korid in AD&D. &D. So he flies into a rage. He's angry. He strikes out at the party. Uh, they, war they, they fight him off. They don't kill him. He flees into the hills. And the party then has a dialogue with the fish. Well, the fish actually has the information that they were seeking for the next part of their quest. The fish is a salmon of wisdom. Now, granted, had the... Now, but by eating the fish, and this is the other thing that the party didn't know, and I actually had this written down just in case one of the party decided, you know what, the old man really wanted to eat the fish. I'm going to eat the fish. So the old, if you eat the fish, you'd get a permanent plus one to your wisdom score because it's the salmon of wisdom. So, but they don't eat the fish. They talk to the fish. The fish... He's the salmon of wisdom. He knows a crap ton of information. So they're able to get some intel off this fish. But getting back to the fae, this is all a very fae encounter. Now, whether the fish is another form of fae or not, or just some sort of enhanced, enlightened, spiritual animal, or maybe a manifestation of some other fae creature, that doesn't, it doesn't need to be played in here. It was a great encounter, but it draws from the fae myth. If you've read folklore and stuff, you'll probably recognize some themes in there. And I may have actually borrowed some of that stuff whole cloth from some other stories. But that's how you do it when you're DMing. So, encounters with the Fae can really actually spice up the travel time for your party. It's a great place to get information. Dryads and ancient trees, if you can make them happy. That tree's been there for a while. They've seen a lot. They may have heard a lot, you know, around their trees. Um... You know, the satyrs in the forests, you know, the pixies, the sprites. These things have all been around. And most fae, unless you're getting into the realm of, like, red caps and crap like that and mean locks, aren't bad. Most fae, yet they're at their worst, are mischievous and troublesome. And so you might get tricked by them, but that's kind of part of the fun of the, of the encounter with the fae. Now, the fae, the nice thing about the fae, too is the Fae run the entire gamut of challenge rating, if you're using CR, or just toughness in general. If you're run, you know, Fae will give you encounters at low levels, they'll give you mid-range encounters, and if you get up into some of the Fae lords and stuff like that, you know, the, the, the you know, members of the Fae court, or NPCs that are higher levels of these, these lesser Fae, or, you know, um, the Eldarin, you know, the Fae elves, the elves from the Fae round, uh, the, the, um, was it? I don't even know it. The Fey Realm, oh, whatever they call it. <clears throat> um, they, the, these guys, you know, you can run with them across the board. They can make good NPCs because most of them, while they have some useful abilities, they're not hit point dumps. So, you know, having a, you know, a boggle team up with the party for a little bit gives them almost like this. Weird kind of Smeagol character. 
you know, if, if, if they ever put brownies back in the games, those guys were really kind of generic fey. They were a short little dude with some minor magic, but they made great NPCs. A pixie, yes, they can fly and they have sleep darts, but they're no more effective and, and impressive than a magic user in that regard. So a fey can make good NPCs. They were great encounters for information, for role-playing. Because the whimsical nature of fairies, even a combat encounter with a fairy can be very entertaining for your party. They're going to be joking and jibing and often tricking in, uh, the, the players and, and making fools of the players, uh, the player characters as they're fighting them. You know, as NPCs, they're a good support character. As, as uh, role-playing encounters, you can play up that whimsy. How they meet them, you know, are they going to meet them face-to-face? -face? Are they going to meet them through some sort of guise that they're holding? You know, what is it that is going to, you know, th those fey encounters... It could be an old man on a road, but that old man on the road could be, you know, a nymph in disguise. That old man on the road could be a corrid, you know, in disguise. The beggar that you stopped to help could down the road turn out being some local fae that appreciates your humanity. Often the fae are depicted as some sort of odd, weird, like, test for our humanity, you know, they, they, the, the, the people who live around them, their interactions with them, very much determine how those fey react to them. Setting out some food in the inn gets you the reward of some house cleaning. <clears throat> you know, putting a blo an extra block of cheese in the corner of the barn <clears throat> protects your barn from, <clears throat> uh, from rustlers or, you know, you know picking posies and ra re putting them in a wreath. You know, and leaving them hanging from a nail above <clears throat> your children's bedroom might please the fae enough to keep your child from being carried off into the woods. The, when you're creating a game world, and this is, you know, for DMs who are doing world building, when you're creating a game world, thinking of these little rituals and stuff helps enhance the, con the, the feeling of your setting and, and build up the nature of the interaction between the people and the creatures in their world beyond just a... Those woods are full of goblins. You know, oh, the hills are full of orcs. You know, don't go out at night because the werewolf will get you. Now, those are good, and certainly that kind of local lore is, 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 is nifty as well. But I think the richness of a setting comes from those little minor tweaks. You know, those little folksy charms. But anyways, <clears throat> so I'm hoping that 5th edition will actually continue to put out more fey. Uh, fortunately, uh, there's a lot of homebrew stuff being generated for the Fae as well. If you go over to the Unearthed Arcana uh, uh, site over on Reddit, uh, that is a constant stream of new material for 5th edition, and a lot of it is pretty well vetted by the community, so it's, it's, it, some of it's pretty well balanced. I usually look at the, the comment history and uh, the revision history on things before I, I plug them into my campaign, but there's a lot of good monster work going on there. Uh, conversions from older versions of D&D to newer versions of D&D are not impossible, and certainly most of the abilities that Fey are going to have are mirrored somewhere in another monster. So going back to some of my quick and dirty monster videos, if there is a Fey that you want to make and it's not in 5th edition, find a Fey that's close, borrow abilities from another creature, plug them into that Fey, and you have a close approximation to that original Fey that you liked. Um, Wizards of the Coast, you know, Watsi, I hope you guys are going to add more Fey. Um, having a book on the Feywild, see, I remember what it's called now. Having some sort of official supplement for the Feywild would be great. Uh, I think that'd be a great place to plug in a bunch of monsters, or maybe the next big campaign arc will take place in the Feywild or around the Feywild. I know the Feywild has been touched on in some of the other campaign arcs, but because I don't really run published adventures, I can't say how much they, they work they work their way in. I know when I'm reading through other published works, I see a lot of references to the Feywild and the Shadowfell for the uh, for that uh, that matter. That matter. Um, but it doesn't seem like there's been an official resource put out for those so i'm hoping we'll see one of those whether it's a campaign arc or an actual book in the future it seems like there's a a wealth of information that can put in there i mean looking over the list of what's out right now a lot of these are good encounters but some of these some of these things that they call fey aren't they're not useful for fey encounters a blink dog is not overly fey 
to me. I mean, it's it's assigned as a fey, I think, just because they didn't want to make another monstrosity. I don't know. You know, a yeth hound is 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 it, that works because that's kind of like your you know hound of the Baskervilles or your 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 death hound or the the the, the you know whatever. Um, Mean locks were always weird because mean locks to me doesn't didn't look like a fae, and I don't think in the in the fiend folio where they originally came from they were intended as a fae. I'll have to go back and read that to make sure. Darklings got plugged in to the fae because I think they needed evil fae, but darklings to me, you know, which were originally dark creepers and dark stalkers from the fiend folio were never, they were always kind of their own humanoid race. I always got the feeling that they were more of a, some sort of extra planner thing, kind of like the Githyanki and the Githzeri were, where they were just, they were their thing. But, you know, Boggles and Quicklings and Red Caps and Anise Hounds and Corids and Green Hags, Dryad Satyrs, Sprites, Pixies, those are all good stuff. But bring us back a basic brownie. A Leprechaun wouldn't be bad. Hell, I'd even take a Cluricon or a Spriggan or a Gripply. Griblies, uh, were they? Fa no, the Griblies were the frog dudes. Griggs, Griggs were the grasshopper guys. Uh, Hibsils, how about a Hibsil? A Hibsil was like a little fey antelope centaur thing. And where are the centaurs? Why aren't centaurs fey? If satyrs are fey, why aren't centaurs fey? I want to know, Watsy, and bring back the Atomi. Crossbow wielding little dudes were cool. Anyways, this is Eli from Elf Bates. This has been me yammering on about the Fae. Look out there everywhere. Leave out your butter rolls and your cream at night. That way they clean your house and you don't have to. Have a good one. Get out and game.